Alright. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. Um, so a couple of announcements before the uh, the, the talk. Uh, so so the se second floor there's a uh, uh, cafe. Uh, second of a really genuine cafe, so you can just enjoy your, uh, the coffee or some snacks over there if you want. And also my office is the um, <coughs> S O two two. Uh, so if you go to fourth floor, uh, you can find my office. So I keep my office door op uh, office door open. So they're free free to stop by. That uh, means you will not always be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then for lunch, uh, because of the, I mean, pro, uh, I mean, we are approaching to the spring festival, so somehow we couldn't issue some, uh, how to say, lunch brochure and so on. But uh, my students will help to go to canteen uh, and then some buy the lunch for you guys. So I mean, for lunch you can just uh, um, go with my students, or the canteen food is not impressive. So uh, you can go out. Uh, I can tell you the location. So what, even Westgate and South Southgate, there is a bunch of restaurants. So you can find. So I will tell uh, you can just go out to find a better food. Okay, so that's the thing. And then for speakers, uh, during the break, uh, next break after the junior's talk, uh, we'll correct the original document for like a train tickets or boarding pass. So if you bring it, uh, please uh, give it to me. Uh, next to, next to the how is it? <coughs> the break, and then tea, and then the snacks. Uh, we just uh, temporarily put out, out, out there so you can enjoy it. Uh, the the uh, feel free to grab whatever you want, and then yeah. Uh, so the, also this unfortunately. Uh, the, well, fortunately, <laughs> there are many uh, like uh, like a foreigners, foreign audiences, so that the uh, so the the gontong ye yu shi ying yu. So the 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 if you ask questions on all the the, the question or like answer should be or all the talk are supposed to be the English. So that's the role for our workshop, and I hope the yeah people <coughs> will enjoy this. Uh, workshop and if you have questions uh, please let me know ah and also yeah so the on Wednesday night uh, so we will have a speaker dinner to the, the cross to the hotel it's called your fan so yeah if you don't have any schedule so yeah you're welcome to join the speakers dinner that's it uh, any questions at this moment Okay, so it's a uh, time. So we are glad to have our first speaker from uh, uh, Junior Yaki from Yao Center. Uh, he's going to ask about the massage when 3D in the law system. So thank you uh, for Sarashi uh, for organizing this wonderful conference. I'm very glad this is my first time in Shanghai actually. I spent in China for three years because of COVID and couldn't really travel. Um, so that was an excuse. Okay, so I'm going to talk about cluster algebras and 3D integral systems. And then, uh, then I realized I forgot to mention anything about quantum field theory in the title. But uh, these are actually related to quantum field theory. Thank you. Um, so I'll try to emphasize this, the, the relations to uh, quantum field theory and and even string theory um, along the way. So uh, this uh, work is based on my uh, joint papers, uh, which I co-authored with my student Xiao uh, Yuesun from Tsinghua, and uh, also three mathematicians, Ray Inoue from Chiba University, Atsuo Kuniba from Tokyo, and Yuji Terashima, I think he's in Tohoku. Um, so, what is this about? So let me first remind you a little bit of statistical mechanics. So uh, this talk is going to be at least a, a, 
uh, two thirds of this talk is going to be very elementary. Okay, so I'm going to go slowly by just reviewing basics about two-dimensional lattice spin models in statistical mechanics. So what is this? So uh, let's consider a torus. So this square is actually a torus. So I impose periodic boundary conditions in both horizontal and vertical directions. And uh, I have drawn a lattice, two by three lattice. So by these uh, black lines, and these lines are oriented. Okay. And I put something we call spin variables, this circle on the edges of, of this lattice. Okay. And I assume that they take n different discrete values, one to up to big n. And what they do is that these spin variables are some kind of physical degrees of freedom, like electrons. Okay. They are arranged in this lattice manner, and they interact. And when they interact, they have some interaction energy. So let's suppose, let's look at, let's pick one vertex or intersection of two lines and suppose that spin variables around it, there are four of them, they take values i, j, k, and l, making this kind of local configuration. And let's write its interaction energy. So four of them interact around this vertex and let's say that its interaction energy is e, i, j, k, l. The goal of one of the goals of statistical mechanics is to compute this quantity, the partition function z. What is that? So, uh, if you recall static statmec, it's the uh, summation over all configurations of spin variables uh, of e to the minus total energy e divided by Boltzmann constant k e times temperature of the system. And here e is a total energy, and it's just the sum of the or these local energies, so some of the bodies. Uh, so this is uh, the definition of the partition function, and this gives you how to calculate the partition function, which we don't do, but it's in general very hard. Meaning, well, you can write down this, but uh, to get an analytic expression, nice expression for it, the partition function is very difficult, unless this model, particular model you're considering has a special property. So uh, for special class of models, calculation can be done. And uh, well, <laughs> yeah, all right. So that special class of models I'm going to talk about are integrable lattice models. So what are what are they? All right. So uh, instead of these spin variables i j k l, which take n different values. Let's assign, let's consider an n-dimensional vector space and assign it, assign vector space V8 to the eighth line. All right, so these are the lines consisting or comprising the lattice. And let's introduce this matrix RAB to, uh, for each intersection of line A and line B. So there's this matrix RAB. It's an operator acting on V8 into VB. And the definition of this operator is the following. RAB has indices IJ on the bottom, indices KL on top, right? Two indices, two indices on bottom and top, because it acts on VA tensor VB, right? So it's, it's kind of twofold tensor product, all right? So it's, this is just defined by E to the minus E KL, IJ KL divided by KB So this is just, this just gives you the, uh, all matrix elements of or A, B, and hence defines this operator, which I call the R matrix. Uh, if this, so this R matrix can be defined in this manner for any two-dimensional lattice models, but if this operator satisfies the, the celebrated young box equation, which, is, which takes this form, R, R, R equals R, R, um, then this model is, is known to be integrable. Uh, so let me explain what this means. Uh, probably some of you might have, is not familiar with this young box equation. So here, each side of the equation is actually endomorphism acting on V1 tends to V2 tends to V3. These are, these act on this space. All right. And R12, for example, by this I mean 
this is an operator R acting on V1 tensor V2. V2. R13 is acts on V1 tensor V3 by R operator, R matrix, and so on. Um, he has a very famous, actually, uh, nice pictorial expression for this yeah, Bax equation, which looks like the following. So this is the easiest way to remember the young Bax equation. You just draw three intersecting lines. Okay. Um, let's say what you have line one here going diagonally, and line two going horizontally, uh, line three going diagonally down. Right? So the inter intersection of line one and line two, which is here, I assign this operator R12. Right? And you start from here, you follow the direction of line, and then the next intersection you hit is actually this one. That's the intersection between line one and line three, to which I assign R13. And final intersection is this R23, which is the intersection of line one and line two and line three. Right? That, and that represents the left hand side. So left hand side is equivalent to this picture. All right. And then what, what's the right hand side? Right hand side is basically what you obtain by taking one of the three lines on the left hand side, let's say this horizontal line, you pick it, you move it upward, and so that until you obtain this configuration. All right. And right hand side, if you uh, use the same rule, correspond, you see that it corresponds to the right hand side of the Young Bax equation. So the Young Bax equation says that the physics is actually the same, remains the same, when you move, do this move of lines. Right? Uh, so when the, uh, this equation actually is known to, well, um, known to imply integrability of the model. And if you have integrability, it helps you a lot uh, when you try to compute the body function. So I'm skipping some details here, but uh, let me just say this as a fact. Okay. So uh, examples of such integral lattice models, uh, famous examples are the egg body model, which is actually equivalent. Was, this is a two-dimensional classical statistical mechanics model. It's actually equivalent to one-dimensional quantum uh, model, which is known as the XYZ spin chain. Uh, so they are equivalent. Um, the uh, two-dimensional Isaac model is another example. So there are a bunch of examples. Right. Um, also, what's more interesting, what's probably more interesting to you is the fact that uh, the young Bakhti equation appears actually from many high energy theory uh, contexts. Uh, one example is the appears from various serosymmetric gauge theories in uh, dimensions 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 and 6, actually. And string theory uh, and quiver varieties and uh, Yangian acting on homology and uh, of those quiver varieties and so on. So it's, uh, this is a very interesting and very well-studied equation. It has a lot of influence both in physics and mathematics. But now, so this is about 2D, all right? So now the natural question is, what about the spin model? on a three-dimensional lattice, right? Why don't we go one-dimensional height? So uh, here in 3D, we can do something similar. So if you think about 3D lattice, what's, uh, what consists of 3D lattice are planes. Planes intersect, okay? So I've drawn three planes in different colors here. Um, they intersect, all right? Intersection of three planes is this, this dot, I mean this, intersection of three lines here. Each line is the intersection of a pair of planes, okay? So intersecting planes makes, make a, a three-dimensional lattice. And we can do something similar to uh, what we did in the 2D case. I can assign a vector of space B, A, B to the intersection of the A's and B's planes, okay? Now, I can also introduce this R matrix but now R matrix, each R matrix has three indices on ABC because I assign R ABC to the intersection of A's and B's and C planes, namely here. Okay. And then it acts on the tensor product of B, B, C, B, C, A, B, A, B, uh, with matrix elements given in the same manner. So here I have three dimensional lattice 
local picture of three dimensional lattice created by intersecting three planes. Um, spin variables are located at the edges of this, this lattice, which are drawn by block lines. Okay, and they take values i, j, k, l, m, m. So it's so so this local configuration of spin variables uh, what corresponds this R, uh, the matrix elements of this R matrix. So now, uh, what about integrability? It's actually known that there is a, a natural generalization of the young box equation to three dimensions. It's known as Zamol Chikov's tetrahedron equation. It was introduced by Zamol Chikov in uh, one of the Zamol Chikovs in the 1980s, 1980 actually. And it takes this form. Now, each side of the equation has four R's, right? and this equation implies integrability. So there is also a graphical representation of this equation, which now looks like this. All right, how do we look at this? How, we, how do we understand this picture? So let's take the left hand side. You see a tetrahedron, right? It's this is a tetrahedron, it's, which is bounded by four intersecting planes. Can you imagine that there's a plane, uh, there's a plane in the horizontal direction, and then three other intersecting planes? Binding uh, this tetrahedron. Okay. Now to this picture, uh, I can write course what I can assign this left hand side, right? And um, then to go from the left hand side to the right hand side, you again take one of the planes. Let's say this horizontal plane, which is here. You pull it down, and then you obtain this configuration. Can you imagine that? So these are two different topologically distinct configurations of four intersecting planes. And then tetrahedron equation says that, that the physics remains the same when you do this local move to the to the lattice. And this is known to imply the implies the uh, uh, imply the integrability of the three dimensional model. Uh, it, it is a definition of uh, immobility in 3D system or uh, there's a different definition of that. Of course. I mean this uh, you can take it to be the definition, but what you can do is you can construct something called layer to layer transform matrix. Um, this implies that transform matrix is commute. I see. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Right. So now uh, so so that that's quite nice. We have three-dimensional analog of the young backstage equation. So why don't we study it? And why don't people and maybe you have never heard of the tetrahedron equation before, and why, why is that? All right. So tetrahedron equation actually has a relatively long history. So it was introduced again by 1980. So if you think about it, it was before the BPC paper on the on two-dimensional conformity theory. So it has a long history, actually. But it's fair also to say far, it's far less developed than the young box equation. And the, uh, there's only one book on the subject, uh, which was published uh, authored by Kuniba and published last well two years ago. So there, there's just one book. So why why is that? So uh, actually, it seems to be very very difficult to solve. Right, uh, young box equation is already difficult to solve because it's an over constraining constraint system of equations. But tetrahedron equation is way more complicated. So. Uh, one of the first non-trivial solutions were written down by Samuel Chikov. And then according to what Baxter said about, about this solution, well, he wrote down by what appears to be an extraordinary field of intuition. So it's very, very non-trivial to solve the equation. But uh, actually, it could be as rich, in my opinion, as the young Baxter equation. And interesting solutions have actually been found by these people uh, some Russians, Japanese, uh, one Australian. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, but there are recent developments as well. Um, obviously, uh, the tetrahedron equation, in my opinion, is very important because so this is some fact which string theorists often forget about. So we live in three-dimensional space, and so it's very natural and important to think about three-dimensional statistical mechanics models, right? So, uh, 
Yeah, so what is so that's the, the situation. So what is my work? What is this talk about? Uh, I'm going to yep. confirm like the state of art of this state of art. Yeah. Like uh, uh, so it seems that people are still trying to find a solution to this technology. Yes. yes. So there's no thing like uh, uh, the better that's uh, method. As far as I'm aware, uh, no, there is no systematic method, the given solution, pr and produce uh, the partition solution. People say it's solvable, but we don't know how to solve it. I think there are some examples where the partition functions have been calculated analytically uh, by that stands up, uh, I think, some model. Yeah, but uh, just. Uh, Maybe like one or two models. Yeah, so we are still at the stage of finding interesting solutions and try to understand the structures. Okay. So uh, this talk is about a new approach uh, which I proposed with my student, Xiao Yue, uh, and which uses class algebras. Um, uh, if you have never heard of class algebras, this appears in many different places, including supersymmetric gauge theories on the scattering amplitudes and so on. Uh, so, uh, in my work uh, in, uh, with Xiao Yue in 2022, we actually constructed uh, three new solutions using something we call triangle, square, and butterfly quivers and related them to the S3 partition functions of three dimensional n equals two supersymmetric gauge theories. And then uh, it was, this was followed up by Inoue Kuniba and Terashima from uh, last year. And they have, they kind of develop this, further develop this approach and then reproduce no solutions and construct new solutions using the first two quivers, triangle quiver and square quiver. And then uh, in my ongoing work, which we actually submitted to archive, but it's on hold for like past uh, one or two weeks. I don't know why, right? so it will appear soon. <laughs> uh, uh, we constructed two more solutions of the tetrahedron equation using uh, some slight modification of this butterfly quiver, which we call symmetric butterfly quiver. So I'm going to explain the last uh, development, last item in the list. And also, I would like to mention that uh, uh, Gabrielenko's uh, Semenyak and Zenkevich, actually they constructed something called classical L operator, which is closely related to this tetrahedron equation using class and integrable systems. And the relation of our work to this is not clear yet. And uh, what's, uh, what I really like about our approach is that actually it can reproduce many known interesting solutions of the tetrahedron equation. Actually, most of them can be obtained from our solutions by some kind of reduction or taking special limits. And also, I suspect that uh, I'm pretty sure that there are interesting connections to three manifolds used via the 3D3 correspondence. And also, it uh, should be related to wall crossing phenomena of BPS particles in 3 n equals 2 theories. It can be related to Fortitian science theory and so on. So, a lot of interesting things to explore. Okay, so uh, this is kind of the uh, conclusion of the introduction. I've spent 20 minutes already. But if you have any questions before moving on, no? Okay. All right, so let me move on. So I'll be a little bit mathematical, um, but uh, not much because I don't know mathematics very well. Uh, the, so let me remind you, start, start by reminding you of the symmetric group SM. Okay, so what is that? So this is uh, group of permutations of n different objects. And it's generated by something called uh, simple or adjacent transpositions S1, S2, up to S n minus 1. They satisfy these relations. Uh, probably you have uh, learned this before. But I'm not going to be interested in the elements of Sn uh, well, S per se. I'm more interested in an expression like this, some product of these simple transpositions, let's say SA1, SA2, da, 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 SAK. All right, so suppose you're given this kind of expression. 
right? And what you can do, one thing you can do is you can represent this by a diagram. And this diagram is called wiring diagram, and it's going to play an important role. So let's say that I have this uh, expression S1, S2, S3, S1, S2, S1 in symmetric group S4. So I take n equals 4 here. To represent this expression, I use four intersecting curves. All right? These are called wires, all right? drawn in blue. So I have y1, y2, y3, y4. They make this kind of pattern. Okay. So the, you want to read the, this diagram, this wiring diagram from left to right. All right. So if you start from left, you have wires 1, 2, 3, 4. But then here, wire number 1, nine, wire number 2 are uh, will intersect. So they switch their position. All right. To this intersection, I assign this Trans what, transposition S1. And next, I have Y1 and Y3 intersecting. But if you start again from this, after the first transposition, that's the second and third wires switching their position. To this intersection, I assign the transposition S2 and so on. Okay. So you see that to each uh, expression like this, you can draw this diagram. And vice versa. Now, uh, I also uh, consider two wiring diagrams which are topologically equivalent to be equal, right? which amounts to imposing the second relation in the symmetric group. So anyway, so you can now forget about the symmetric group. You can focus on this wiring diagram. I'm going to use this diagram to construct something interesting. Okay. Now. Uh, what can you do when you are given that kind of diagram? Right? What I'm going to do is to a wiring diagram, I assign a quiver. Quiver is some, uh, it's just a directed graph, right? So graph has vertices and edges, but directed graph has, well, for a directed graph, each edge is oriented. So you have vertices and arrows connecting vertices. So what I do is the following. Given that kind of diagram, I put vertices on the crossing of wires and chambers uh, of the diagram. Okay. So and around each crossing of two wires, I draw arrows like, like this. So here, I have two wires, two curves crossing. Okay. I have put uh, vertex here at the crossing of two wires and four vertices in the surrounding white areas. Okay. And I draw arrows. There are two kinds of arrows, solid ones drawn in the middle, right? Connecting the middle vertex. And dashed one. Dashed arrows, you can think of it as like think of them as like half arrows. Okay. But so you can draw this kind of picture. Alright? And then you can do that for to every for every crossing, and then some uh, between some vertices, you will have multiple arrows which you can combine into one. Right? So if you have half arrows, like if you have uh, two dashed arrows connecting the, the same pair of vertices in the same direction, they are combined into one solid arrow, but uh, arrows in different directions tend to cancel. So uh, this is an example of this procedure applied to three wires crossing in this and making this kind of pattern. So I have Y number one, Y number two, Y number three. You can assign this graph, this quiver. All right. So this is a quiver which I call the symmetric butterfly quiver for a reason that will be apparent later. All right. Assigned to this wiring diagram. So important point here is that given a wiring diagram, you can assign a quiver. Okay. Now, okay. So uh, because we are talking about quiver, I would like to introduce some important notions, operations that you can do perform to quivers. One is something called mutation, mu k, which you can apply at vertex k of a quiver. All right. 
So this is a transformation of one quiver, right? That kind of directed graph to another quiver, right? Um, uh, this appears also in silver symmetric gauge theories. So if you have never heard of mutations, this is a good time to learn. Right? So what you do is the following. So suppose you apply this mutational operation mu k to vertex k, right? And then you look at vertex k, and suppose the vertex k is connected to vertex i and j by arrows in this manner. So suppose you see this pattern in your quiver. All right. And when you apply mutation mu k, what you do is first you add an additional arrow going from i to j, okay, and then reverse the orientation of all arrows connected to k, and then you do some combination of arrows, right? So arrows going in opposite directions they they cancel and so on. So this is an example. So let's say you're given this quiver with solid arrows and, and dash arrows. Dash arrows, remember, they are half arrows. And you want to apply this mutation operation to the to this middle node, okay, here. What you do in the first step, you look at, uh, you have to, you want to add an arrow when, whenever you see this kind of pattern, right? So I, you see this pattern, that pattern here, are going to the mutation, <laughs> mutated vertex, and then going out of the mutated, mutated vertex. So you want to add an arrow going from here to here, and so on. Okay, so after the first step, you obtain this graph, and then you do the second uh, step. You just reverse all arrow, well, the direction of all arrows connected to this middle vertex. So these four arrows, they are reversed. Okay, and then I do some cancellation of arrows. So for example, on the uh, top right part, you see two arrows going in the opposite directions, they are cancelled. But here on the top bottom left part, you have one solid arrow and one half arrow, dash arrow, going in the opposite direction. So you are left with one half arrow here, and so on. Okay. So this is the mutation operation. So the important point is thing to remember is mutations are involutive. So if you apply mutation, same mutation twice, then you get back to the same quiver. Okay, so that's mutation. Another operation uh, that's important is actually something we call automorphism. This is much trivial, more trivial than mutation. It's just a permutation of vertex that so it's just a relabeling of label of vertices. So that's kind of trivial. But when I, when I say a cluster transformation, it's a composition of any sequence of mutations and automorphisms. So uh, so later I will use this word cluster transformation, but it's just uh, it just means that I have applied mutations of automorphisms, real labelings. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, now that you have two kinds of arrow, mm -hmm. half arrow and full arrow, uh, you can also introduce some half mutation or something like this. I, well, that, actually, that's, that's not my, it's not my question, but uh, yeah. what, what, what is your motivation to use a half arrow? Uh, well, my motivation is, unless I use half arrows, I couldn't construct the solution to the future equation. So, it's not clear physically where half arrows come from, because in gauge theories, we don't have like half chiral multiplies. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure about physics meaning. Of half arrows, but mathematically I needed to introduce half arrows. But I, I will comment on more about that. Okay. So uh, this is what these are operations I can I will, I'm going to perform to my quivers. Okay. Anyway, so now, uh, so now let's go back to this wiring diagram. All right, and then to wiring diagrams we could assign uh, quivers. So now, given wiring diagram, that kind of diagram, I can do some kind of operation, which is going to be important. So that operation is called the braid move. So suppose you have wire A and wire B and wire C making this kind of pattern locally in your diagram. I can perform this braid move beta ABC, which, which transforms this pattern to this pattern. So what I did is I took the middle wire, I moved it up. 
Good, so this is a nice local operation. But the important point you want to remember is that this induces a cluster transformation, the sequence of mutations basically, to the corresponding quiver. All right. So to this left pattern, this was the assigned quiver. All right. And then what you do is you apply mutation at Vitex 4, and then Vitex 3, Vitex 5, Vitex 8, and then you do some relabeling. It's, this is, you can actually ignore the relabeling if you want to. But then you are, you are, uh, you arrive at this final quiver, which actually is a quiver assigned to the, to this diagram. All right. So this local transformation of your wiring diagram is actually equivalent to sequence of mutations. All right, so this is a key point. Okay, so this is some just some observation you can do. Now, uh, let me connect this to what you love, uh, gauge theories. So, given a quiver, that kind of diagram with vertices and arrows, you uh, well, well, you can write down a gauge theory with four supercharges. So what you can do is uh, one of the, yeah there are of course uh, some nuances and different ways of doing that but one way is the following to the vertex i of your quiver diagram you assign a gauge group let's say s u n of uh, and i label it by i so s u n i and to each arrow connecting vertices i and j you can introduce a matter multiply in your super symmetry gauge theory, which transforms into by fundamental representation of SU and I times SU and J. Right. Um, and coming back to this uh, question, uh, yeah. Uh, so here there's a problem with half arrows because there are no half like multiplets, right, in, in this kind of theory. Uh, if you don't like that, you can actually replace this quiver by this quiver what you yeah and, and you can actually do most of, of what I'm going to do using this rule instead of uh, this one this one with half hours right. so this one is what I called butterfly quiver in my previous paper because it looks like a butterfly to me well I, I can come up with a better name but then uh, in our new paper, I introduced, we, we realized we have to use actually this one. So this is a symmetrized version of butterfly quiver. So that's why we call it the symmetric butterfly quiver, which doesn't look like butterfly at all. <laughs> uh, so uh, maybe we should have come up with a better name. But anyway, so you can actually use the, this quiver if you want to. All right. But this is what you can do. So let's summarize uh, what we have done so far. So given this wiring diagram, right, with of, of these curves intersecting in a plane, you can assign a quiver, and then when you are assign when you have a quiver, you can write down gauge theory. So we have uh, an assignment of gauge theory to wiring diagram. So from now on, whenever you see wiring diagram, you can think of it as a gauge theory. Okay. So now, uh, in, that, in that context, some mutations, uh, which I just introduced in the previous slide, which transforms one quiver to another quiver, that translates to a transformation of one gauge theory to another gauge theory. But that transformation actually turns out to be infrared geology. So if you, they, the two theories assigned to two quivers related by mutation go to the same infrared fixed point, right, roughly speaking. Okay. Is it 3D gauge theory? Uh, well, this, I, I'm very vague about it. <laughs> Here, you can think of it as, say, 40 n equals 1, or 3 or 2D. Of course, you have to think about transcendence level and so on, but let me, let me forget about those. So basically, mutations translate to infrared geologies. So that's something. So there's a huge body of work on that. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, what is the way we go back to the uh, translate this mutation back to the theory? Uh, does it mean anything? Can you, can you test them? 
Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Oh, oh, so yeah. you can transform the wiring. Yes. And each and you can <coughs> translate the wiring back to a group element inside S10. Okay. Yeah, oh, I see. I see. Uh, Does it have any group theory meaning? So you're only posing relation to, right? So, so right. So yes, real. Yeah. So right. Drave root corresponds to to right the real. So there are three relations, and I only imposed so far relation number two, but grade move actually corresponds to relation number three. But uh, actually, I don't want to impose relation number three. Uh, so this is a, maybe a, I'm just confusing you, but I'm going to explain that point. But anyway, so yeah, let me come back to, yeah, thank you for the uh, question. I will comment more on that. So let me come back to this point. So what do I, do you really mean by two theories of dual? All right. So uh, it means the following. Suppose you have theory number one, so let's call it T and dual theory T dual. They are dual. Uh, that means that when you calculate some physical quantity X in the, the same quantity X in the two theories, they are equal. So that's what I mean by dual theory. Now, Let's go back to what, where we were. So we saw that a braid move you can apply to your wiring diagram induces a cluster transformation. It's a sequence of mutations, and which means that the, the theories assigned to wiring diagrams, okay? Remember, wiring diagrams define your, your theories, right? And when you apply braid move, this kind of move going from left diagram to right diagram, they, they correspond to dual theories. That's the uh, conclusion you can draw from what I said so far. So when you calculate some quantity x in the respective theories, right now wiring diagrams you can think of as theories, they are equal. Okay. Now, so let's look at this theory, this diagram slash theory. So to this diagram, you have well, you have this quiver and so on, but you notice that this diagram can be decomposed into three simpler diagrams. So this quiver can be decomposed into three simpler quivers, or this theory can be decomposed into three simpler theories. Okay, uh, you see that. So you can start from three copies of this simple theory. You can combine by identifying, say, uh, some vertices and arrows, and you can construct the left hand side, this more complicated theory. <laughs> so now, the point is, if this quantity x you're considering calculating is sufficiently nice, such as something called superstructure index, we have the corresponding decomposition at the level of this quantity x. So this quantity x calculated in this complicated theory, can be decomposed into the well, similar quantity x, but calculated in simpler theories. Okay. So this equation can be decomposed into this equation. But what is this equation? This equation is just a young box equation, where RAB, R matrix RAB, is this quantity x calculated in this simple theory assigned to this simple Dive. Okay, so this is known as the gauge YB corresponds was uh, developed by by Masahito Yamazaki, myself, Wangbin, and, and many others. So this is known from like ten years ago. Now, uh, it's very nice, uh, but what this is the unbox equation. This is not tetrahedral equation. So to get tetrahedral equation, we want to lift the whole story one level up. What do I mean by that? Right. So we got an equality x of something is equal to x of another theory. Uh, but it's, so that's, that's an equation you get. You get an equation because you calculate some quantity, some number. 
But instead of such numbers, let's think about, let's consider space of states, q bar space of state of each theory. Then, when you have two dual theories and you consider the corresponding q bar spaces, right, they are not equal. Theories being dual means that these spaces are isomorphic but not equal. All right. So by considering dual theories corresponding to two diagrams related by braid move and considering Hilbert spaces, you get an isomorphism. Okay. So uh, in this way, I can introduce this isomorphism R A B C. So it's an isomorphism which gives an isomorphism between the Hilbert spaces of space of theories uh, given by three wires A, B, C intersecting in, in this manner and intersecting in this manner. So this is a, a very crucial point, so I hope this is clear. All right, now, there's something very interesting about this isomorphism, which comes from the fact that there is this very interesting loop of trade moves, okay? So let's start from four wires making this kind of pattern, and I can apply four Braid moves and four inverse braid moves. And then this diagram, actually, if you go through this sequence of braid moves, you notice that this diagram comes back to the starting diagram. So this there's a this loop of braid moves. But then if you think about the corresponding Hubert spaces of the, the theories assigned to the quivers assigned to these theories, these diagrams, you know you this the existence of this loop of brain moves means that if you compose these isomorphism, corresponding isomorphisms, this is going to be an operator acting on the Hilbert space of this theory assigned to this diagram. Okay? Now, you, you see that four R's and four inverse R's acting, and then it's uh, some operator assigned to one space. Now suppose that this operator, for some reason, is actually the identity operator, you see what one. Then, if that's the case, then this equation, this is just the distribution equation. Okay? So the question is, uh, whether this uh, composition of isomorphisms is equal to one or not. So this is a, a question you can ask, all right, and then you can try to calculate it. Uh, I don't know how to do it. Uh, so that's a big uh, direction to be uh, explored, I think. I don't, I don't, so if anyone knows how to calculate this for 40 n equals one theories, for example, three gauge theories. I would be very happy to listen to you, but I don't know how to do, how to calculate these isomorphisms. But there are actually simpler theories, which are not super symmetric gauge theories, but rather just quantum mechanical systems, uh, for in which you can do something similar and you can show that this is equal to one. And that, those quantum mechanical systems, bosonic quantum mechanical systems, are something you can construct by with the help of something called quantum cluster algebras. And that was the main result of my work with Xiao Yue. Now, uh, in the final 15 minutes, what well, I want to explain, well, let's <laughs> see, all of those, uh, that's <laughs> unrealistic. <laughs> All right, so, yeah, okay. Uh, you may have less coffee than usual. <laughs> so, so now, uh, I have to obviously explain to you what class, quantum class algebras are. Uh, it's just some kind of non-commutative algebra. All right, so let me try. So, so remember you have this quiver directed graph. Uh, uh, such a quiver, graph quiver can be encoded in a anti-symmetric matrix, which is called exchange matrix of the quiver, B, right? So it's anti-symmetric, and then indices run over all vertices of, of that quiver, all right? And in our case, uh, so how you, uh, what are the values of these matrix elements, Vij, 
Well, Bij is equal to zero when there's no arrow between vertex <laughs> i and vertex j. If there is equal to one, if there is a solid arrow going from vertex i to vertex j, and then one half hit that arrow is one is dash arrow. So if there is dash arrow from vertex i to vertex j, that's one. Bij is one half. And then Bji are the have the opposite sign. And then you given the quiver, you could apply this mutation mu k that transforms the quiver to another quiver and therefore transforms the exchange matrix B to another matrix. And there's a formula which you don't have to remember. But now let me introduce this cluster algebra. So I'm going to use this notation curly Y of B. It's uh, well, it's just a uh, uh, well, skill field. So it's just some rational expressions generated by non-commutative variables, which I call quantum Y variables. So Y i is assigned to vertex i. All right. So each vertex has its own variable, one variable, and Y i and Y j satisfy this non-commutative relation. All right. Um, Q and there's this power Q to be ij. So when vertex i and vertex j in your quiver are connected by arrow, the corresponding uh, y variables are non commuted. Okay. Now there's this mutation mu k you, you can apply to your quiver. That important point is that actually induces an isomorphism between the corresponding quantum class algebras. And its isomorphism is denoted by mu k star. It's supposed to be what well, it's de well, you can call it a pullback of mu k. Okay. It's, it has this nice formula which can be written in two different ways, but the result is the same, the same uh, isomorphism. So here there is an adjoint action by something called a quantum dilogarithm. And then this tau k part, there are different versions, tau k plus and tau k minus, right? Tau k plus minus are defined by this formula. So there are two uh, ways to decompose the same isomorphism, and they are distinguished by a choice of sign. Now, so this is uh, so I have defined quantum cluster algebras assigned to quivers and gave you a rule to transform to go from one quiver to another mutate, mutate, mutated quiver and shows you how the corresponding quantum y variables are related. Okay. Now let's go back to the this break move. Right? So I had this break move. Uh, the wiring diagram transforms and then the assigned quiver also transform. But now I have shown you before that there is this loop of braid moves which uh, transforms one this wiring diagram and then all the way around the loop and the, the diagram comes back to itself. All right, so it corresponds to this equation. So this is the loop of braid moves I showed you before. Now, if you calculate, so remember each break move corresponds to a sequence of mutations. So there is a corresponding composition of isomorphisms of quantum y variables. And if you calculate what the, the corresponding transformation of quantum y variables is, then it turns out that the, this corresponding induced transformation is also trivial. So not just the wiring diagram and the corresponding quivers, but also the y variables come back to the initial value after you apply this operation, loop of break moves. So this actually turns out to be very, very non-trivial fact. In many cases, you have something like this relation, but the y variables don't come back to themselves. So this is something we, uh, we were kind of lucky that the transformations we looked at have this fortunate uh, property. So this is very non-trivial. So what does this mean? It means that if I 
If I take R hat ABC to be this pullback beta ABC, which acts on quantum wide variables, okay, then this solves the tetrahedron equation. Okay, but let me go back because this means that this operation, okay, this operator is equal to identity when they act on the wide variables. But if you remember, this being identity is equivalent to the tetrahedron equation, right? So in this way, I could at least construct the solution of the tetrahedron equation, or hat ABC, which act on these y variables. And uh, I was very happy, but uh, but this is actually not what we want. What we want are some operator R A B C which acts on vector spaces, not on algebras like y, y of this quiver. Right? So the question is, given this solution of the tetrahedron equation acting on y variables, how do we construct solution of the tetrahedron equation acting on vector space like this? Okay. So that's the that's a question. And the relation between these y variables assigned to quivers and vectors and quiver spaces are like these y variables are like operators acting on quiver space. Okay? So what we want is actually I want this R hat which acts on operators to be given by conjugation action by R A B C, this kind of operator acting on quiver space. Okay? So this is a relation between the uh, unitary op operator going from one theory to another theory and how operator uh, corresponding operators are uh, transformed. Okay? So I want to construct RABC which has this property. And moreover, I want RABC to solve the tetrahedron equation. So that was the uh, question. And actually, uh, we could do that. Uh, let's see, I have like five minutes, so uh, let me skip some details, but the uh, key point was uh, we could actually construct such solution by writing R hat ABC or R hat 1, 2, 3 in this case, I have taken ABC to, one, to be 1, 2, 3, all right? If you go back to the definition, it looks like, like the form like this. It's some, something very complicated. But anyway, so it's just, just a joint action by some operator times some uh, transformation of y variables. And then what we did was to write down, so to rewrite this part, some transformation of, of y variables as again as a joint of some another operator p123. So that this r hat one two three can be written as a joint by operator r one two three, some operator r one two three, okay. and then moreover we could show that this r one two three actually solves the Tetrahedron equation. So I'm going to skip uh, how uh, some details about how we did that. Okay, so uh, if you want, you can just read this later. Uh, but one important point I would like to mention is that now R123 is some kind of operator acting on Hilbert space, but Hilbert space actually have can be represented by different bases. Okay? And there are two different bases uh, we did we use. One is called the coordinate representation, another one is called momentum representation. And you can calculate matrix element of R, R123, this solution of the Tetrahedron equation in different bases, and in different ways, you get different expressions, different matrices, and they actually reproduce in special limits some interesting known solutions of the Tetrahedron equation. Okay. Uh, so, but, so this is basically how we construct this solution of the Tetrahedron equation. But because you guys are physicists, high energy theorists, so let me mention something that might be a little more interesting to you. All right, so one representation of R, this operator, is by a Fox space. There's Fox space representation of R operator, 
And um, then it's actually, I conjectured in my previous work that that solution actually appears from brain construction in M theory. So basically, M theory, so you have 11 dimensional space time. And I take three directions to be periodic, so you have three torus. Okay. And then remember, three dimensional lattice is constructed from intersecting planes. I literally think of those intersecting planes as intersecting brains. So you have M5 brains in different directions. They intersect, they are planes in, in these three torus, but they go and extend in different directions and they make a lattice. Okay. And then each, well, uh, each uh, edge of this three dimensional lattice is the intersection of two M5 brains. When there are such pair of M5 brains, you can think of think about M2 brains stitch between them. And then my conjecture, my proposal is that the Fox space I talked about is really the Fox space of M2 brains stretch between them. Uh, this is just not some like hand waving argument because you can actually perform some kind of chain of geologies to this configuration, right? namely by going to type 2a and going to apply a t geology and so on. You can relate this to a brain construction for 40 inch time theory in the trigonometric setup. And then there is also a corresponding known relation between solution of the tetrahedral equation corresponding to this brain system and the, and the um, XXC R matrix. So everything matches actually very nicely. So I, I want someone to actually calculate the supersymmetric index of this system. I don't know how to, but probably you can. And I hope you get the uh, partition function of three-dimensional lattice one. Okay. Um, lastly, um, I skipped this with some details, but there's some, well, in my previous work with Xiao Yue, we found some solutions of the Tetrahedron equation in the manner I explained before. And then you, we calculated part of the, uh, the matrix elements of that solution. And it turns out to be that it's, they are equal to the partition functions of some three-dimensional n equals two surface metric gauge theories on a squash three sphere. Okay. So there is this relation between the S3 partition functions and solutions of the Tetrahedron equation. Um, this is very nice because this kind of theory is the, really the kind of theory which arises from compactification of six-dimensional trigonometry theory, zero theory on a three body. Okay. So obviously there should be a relation between the geometry of three manifold and solutions of Tetrahedral equation. Um, uh, so it would be very interesting to pursue this direction. So this is one of the directions I'm going right now. And um, also, uh, we saw a loop of break moves, which corresponds to a loop of quiver mutations. And that kind of loop of quiver mutations appear naturally in the business of wall crossings of EPS particles in 40 n equals 2 Susan gauge theories. Um, there is a, a, also a well known story between the relation between these uh, wall crossings given by domain walls in 40 n equals 2 theories and the geometry of three manifolds. So everything is actually connected. So I think it's very natural and interesting to also explore this direction. Right, so, uh, yeah, so somehow I managed to come to a conclusion by skipping a lot of details. So let me conclude. Uh, conclusion. So uh, one of the messages I would really like to convey is that teacher here equation is interesting because it's a three-dimensional analog to the back equation. It's important, but needs much more study than uh, what's been done so far. Okay. Even most people don't know the name of the teacher here equation. That's, that should be shocking, actually, if you think about how important three-dimensional lattice models are. Okay. And then uh, one, my work with others is that solutions can be actually constructed using quantum cluster algebras 
Um, quantum cluster algebras are related to many important branches of theoretical physics. And also, uh, I mentioned that solutions of tetrahedron equations can be constructed from brains in M theory and three dimensional superspecial case theories. So now we have two different approaches. Uh, one from quantum class algebras, which I talked about, and also they're using brains uh, and uh, from higher dimensional gauge theories, basically. So how are these two approaches related? That's a big question to be answered. Okay. And also connections to three manifolds, wall causing uh, phenomena, they, are, they must be very interesting and fruitful. And finally, I think as physicists, we should also come back to this basic question, what can we say based on all this about three-dimensional statistical mechanic systems like, say, 3D Eisenhower? So that would be a like a far-reaching, is that far-reaching or far-fetched <laughs> goal? All right, so that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, yeah. So, what's the transcendence level? So, for the three D, okay, have a transcendence level. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. I see. Uh, I think they were zero. Oh, so yeah, but abelian. So it has the corresponding three D theory has lots of U one gauge groups and flavor groups, and I think. Uh, levels for all zero. Okay, so but can you include transcendence term? Sure, I mean, you can change the 3D gauge theory plots, but then the corresponding S3 condition function, I suspect they do not satisfy the Fisher Hewitt equation. I have a more basic question. Uh, so, the solution to you uh, constructed from the quantum class of algebras. Uh, do they contain the like the known uh, solutions in the Yes. Uh, actually, most of the interesting and famous solutions can be reproduced. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't have a list, but uh, it reproduces. So this approach reproduces like five different solutions. But still, you can uh, construct new solutions. Yeah. So we kind of generalize those solutions by including more parameters, for example. And the special limits where these parameters take certain values or go to zero, even then we reduce non solutions. For the green construction, you can reduce the system to calculate what's the gauge theory. Right. So that's a very uh, good question, which I didn't have time to. Uh, explain. So what you do is you can take, uh, you can reduce the M theory setup on one of the three circles. Let's say S three, and then you have D fours and N S five brain. And then what did I do? Uh, let me. Yeah. Then you can apply T duality to convert D fours to. Let's see, D5 and D3, and S5 remain as N5. Is that right? Yeah, I'm forgetting already. But anyway, so by reducing on S3, you get a bunch of, of NS5 brains coming from this N53. And then you go to, you apply TDLD once. I don't know which direction, I forgot. But then, then you go to, to B, right? And then you apply Estiality to get a stack of D5 brains. And then you get six dimensional maximally super special gauge theory. But then there is something I did to the geometry which I didn't talk about. I twisted this geometry by saying go, when you go around S3, I rotated the plane not 7, 8, and plane 9, 10. All right. And that twisting. That's something to the resulting six-dimensional gauge theory after this chain of geologies. And that six-dimensional gauge theory is deformed by something called omega deformation. 
Um, that reduces this six-dimensional maximally supersymmetric Yamil's theory to four-dimensional gauge theory, which is purely bosonic. Um, it's called four-dimensional transcendence theory, which was discovered by Costello and studied by Costello, Yamazaki, and Whitney. Um, from there, you, it's known to uh, it's known how to construct solutions to the Yamil's equation using four-D transcendence theory. So in this way, tetrahedral equation and and box equation are related by, by a brain setup. But there is a corresponding relation between solutions of the Trajan equation and box equation in purely in statistical mechanics. So what you do is you have three-dimensional lattice, you take one of the three directions, uh, you make it compact periodic, and you consider compactification of the statistical mechanics model. Right? So three-dimensional model gets compactified and then reduced to, to two-dimensional model. So three-dimensional iterable system becomes two-dimensional iterable system. And you obtain you obtain from tetrahedral equation the unbounded equation. So the, the this uh, so what I just said is a brain version of that construction. Any other questions? Okay, now let's thank the speaker again. So, Pian is not just